So after ending an episode where Aaron destroys the entire military and dress wearing Willie <laughs> during his theater performance, how do we start the next episode with a flashback? But I feel like he's the Warhammer Titan. Am I totally wrong about that? So he might still be alive, Reiner style. So was he sort of expecting him himself to not be around? Yeah, they got wind of something first. Not that it helped. <laughs> or maybe they wanted it. Maybe that was exactly what would help validate their claims. Who's playing who? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that pretty much confirms it. At least someone has a, a conscience. What? Ooh. Ah, there's just so much going on. Firstly, about what he just said, I think there is a qualitative difference about whether or not they wear uniforms. And the difference is choice. Obviously, a big issue in this show, a very interesting topic, is Erwin's morality, right? Erwin himself questions if what he's done is right. You know, sending people to die in the name of his causes. But I think what really does set Erwin apart, as I've said many times in the past, is that there was no trickery, really. There were no lies there. It was just, listen, this is what we want to do. You're almost definitely going to die. Don't join <laughs> unless you're okay with this arrangement. To me, it makes a huge difference. And to me, part of that is respecting the autonomy, the agency of individuals to make their own choices. But in order to make good choices, it kind of assumes they, they know what the choices are, you know, at least to the best of their abilities. By sacrificing civilians, let's say, you're not giving them that choice. You, you are kind of claiming an, an importance on your own ideas over the lives of others, which I think is a, is a type of arrogance and maybe even a type of evil. It's very interesting to me because a lot of what I've heard about the season is things like, well, this is the season where you root for everyone, you know, or like there are no villains. To me, so far, and granted, there's a lot I don't know. It seems like the opposite. It seems like they're they're all villains. Or more accurately and more importantly, they all are doing villainous things. Multiple things can be true at once, you know? Like, we can definitely understand why people would want to use certain tactics to win, you know, especially if their survival's at stake. We can understand why Eren decided to declare war, but that doesn't mean those actions are right. It doesn't mean those actions are moral, and it doesn't mean those actions are an ideal. I think what we can say is that none of this so far is heroic. For me, heroism would be to rise to the challenge, protect the things you love, and ultimately win without violating certain principles and without becoming the same evil that you're fighting. And that's largely what's happening here. Could I do better than Aaron? Probably not. Is killing civilians in the name of other civilians' survival heroic? I don't think so. I'd say the one holdout I have is for Reiner. Because I think rather than cast someone as a villain or hero outright, it's probably more useful to look at their individual actions. And so I think Reiner has the potential for heroism right at this moment. I mean, they all do. That's the good news. You know, like no matter what you've done, you can hopefully do better next time or immediately after, you know, like you're, you are only what you do or what you are doing in the moment. It's just that Reiner seems the most poised for having these moments now because of his inner conflict and his reflection. Other characters seem to be like diving deeper into the justifications of their evil, the justifications of doing terrible things. War has changed. Make sure you wear your best dress for the occasion. <laughs> your whitest dress. Okay, yeah, so this is a little bit of a flip perspective. Aaron is in some ways playing into their hands. Yeah. And it's confusing, you know, speaking of like how to evaluate people. There is a heroic quality here, which is the, the willingness to self-sacrifice, right? Well, so much for <laughs> pulling a Reiner and passing his consciousness elsewhere. He was dedicated to his plan. Can't take that away from the guy. He may not have been great at theater, but he certainly was ambitious. <laughs> Are you not entertained? <laughs> I mean, honestly, let's be real. Willie's play was kind of boring. <laughs> Aaron's appearance was the best thing that could have happened for the audience, entertainment-wise. They wanted a show. <laughs> they got a show. Although, <laughs> given the fact that Willie planned to die as part of his act, you know, respect the dedication to art. That is some real <laughs> artistic expression right there. The Warhammer Titan. So then who has it? Oh, wait, what? Does Aaron have it? Oh no. What could go wrong, I wonder? <laughs>
Or maybe one of the kids has it, I don't know. Did he just body slam that whole row? Oh, I knew it. No, no, no. Not the kids. Oh. Aaron doing the doing the same thing. There's a very interesting parallel there with Aaron. Aaron causing the rock this time to crush crush a loved one instead of witnessing it with his mother. Yeah. This is a big big change for Aaron. I don't know. This is a lot, obviously. It's her. Let's see it. <laughs> I'm excited. Not gonna wait, huh? Okay. Yeah, it's probably just getting warmed up. I don't- what? That was a signal? That wasn't gonna do it. Yeah, okay. Thanks for keeping us all in the loop, McGrath. <laughs> he wouldn't have it any other way. There we go. Yeah. It was gonna do something. Interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. That was the shortest character arc in Attack on Titan history. Udo's a good kid. Uh, unlikely that he is alive, although possible, I guess. Reiner was reaching for him last time we saw him. Get out there and fight the evil people I used to hate, but now I'm rooting for. <laughs> That's why she hugged them. I knew that scene was going to be important. It seemed kind of random at the time. Here we go. I was about to say, Eren's whole plan was not just him showing up and bashing things. I'm holding out a little bit of hope that the scouts have a somewhat differing perspective from Eren. I mean, at this point, like, Eren is going to be tough to control, but I hope that they still have the goodness in them. You know, I hope that people like Connie and Sasha are not just totally down the kill everyone in our way rabbit hole, because that would hurt me a lot. I guess there's some question or debate about how sure it was that Eren would attack, and it's been pointed out to me that he waited until the declaration of war to do so, but, like, my gut feeling about it is that he'd already sort of made up his mind, and I really don't have anything concrete to base that on, but it also sort of doesn't matter to me either way, just because I think the action to do what he did is on some level wrong. What's interesting to me about it is that I think the show is deliberately depicting the fact that Eren is just now the same thing. Like, he decided that killing lots of innocent people was justified in order to stop a greater threat, which is exactly what Marley did to him. And there's this obvious cycle that's formed. And in any conflict, both sides can always find a previous wrongdoing that they have experienced that has been perpetrated on them. And so there's this obvious cycle that's occurring. And I don't mean any kind of like mythological circle like I've posited in the past, but just like a very direct cycle of wrongdoing. And as long as previous injustices are justification for further injustices, there will always be injustices because you can always find ways that people have wronged you. But what's the point of it? You know, to go all the way back to the first ever evil? Does it matter where it began? To me, it matters more what you do next, what you do now. And I think that is one of the elements of heroism is that responsibility of like, whatever the wrongs that have, have happened, whatever the circumstances of life, no matter how dark the world is, as the show says, I am not going to succumb to that. I'm going to do better than that. Even if that takes immense sacrifice, even if it means risking not winning, you know, there's sort of a higher game. Otherwise, you just get this again and again, this very terrible yet highly entertaining <laughs> battle between nations and titans. Interesting aesthetic. Look at those abs! <laughs> Sorry, I had no choice. War Hammer Titan! Very literal. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting. It's like an alchemist titan, in a way. Pretty cool. How do you even win? I mean, even then, you just hope that this War Hammer Titan, like, is always good, or is always on your side. I wouldn't celebrate just yet. Celebration is death. <laughs> it's all going according to plan. Yeah, good luck with that. Cool voice. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> 
Oh, she looks good. She's grown. She's been training. Interesting. This opens up a lot of doors. But they've all, like, been severely upgraded. You don't know about the scouts, man. You don't know about the scouts and what, what they've been through. I don't know how I feel about it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, a, a ray of light and <laughs> darkness. It can construct any weapon it envisions. A warhammer, crossbow, and whip. Huh, that's fun. You're gonna need a full arsenal to fight a fully trained Mikasa. Yeah, yeah. How far do this do you follow Eren if you're the scouts? You know? Were there any dissenters? Like who's not following Eren? It's interesting they have this upgrade, like they got the gear plus guns now. Is that John John? I'm so bad at recognizing animated faces. Oh no, oh no. Him too. Tell him, John John. I prefer the Irwin kind of devil. Yes, Mikasa. Speak in her mind. I like it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I just gained so much, so much respect for Mikasa right there. Such a big difference. Like in the past, we've seen her flip that switch, right? Like threat, die. So I really appreciate the fact that she's actually thinking about that and can say that openly to Aaron. Here's the crossbow. It's got a different spot. If you're Mikasa, you're having second thoughts right now about Eren having all the Titan powers after what you've just seen. So what do you do, though? I mean, they're so far in at this point. Oh, don't say that. You shut your mouth. Shut your damn mouth. I sort of loved Udo. I didn't even think about him until right now, but he was a great kid. New Eren. The cycle continues. Do you not know about Gabby? <laughs> she literally won the last war. Let her through. I love these like kind-hearted guards who love the kids, despite like stopping them from leaving the internment zone. Of course, right after I say how much I like them, no one is safe. You love someone, they they die. <gasps> no, is it Sasha? Don't do that. Honey, no, no. I mean, they look great though. <laughs> Physically, they look great. This is just very upsetting. So many conflicting emotions. Yeah, what do you expect? Like, you're Gabby. Yeah, yeah, it's just the same, it's the same thing. Part of the mistake is actually something that is obvious to say, but actually is so often perpetuated. And it's overgeneralization. Thinking of Marleans as bad, or thinking of Paradise people as bad, or whatever it is, whatever size you're on, doesn't really matter. Time is not really accounted for. Age is not accounted for. Role is not accounted for. Like Gabby, in my mind, even though she's done pretty terrible things, she's not as guilty just because she's so young. She's been completely brainwashed and she hasn't had any other counter influences. Like there's no way for her to know this. So as far as she knows, in terms of her inner world, this is an unfair forgivable atrocity and in many ways it is no matter what her perspective is so in a way it backfires because they attack the marleans they kill people who actually are guilty who are making choices to do evil things but catch all these innocents with that who then use the same logic to be justified to do the same things later so like who's going to be the one you know who's going to be the the hero to break the cycle who's going to be the one to find something better than that and to avoid the you know the seductive but most dangerous traits like the desire for revenge and like rage and all this stuff who do you believe in I don't know if there's a whole lot of good left waiting for you. I made that joke about Mikasa being equipped to fight it. I wasn't wrong. Oh. Is that where the human is? The woman? Very good observation. It's 
in any crystal. Oof. It's very Evangelion though. But in this case, I guess she doesn't have five minutes. You guys gonna just let this happen? You're all okay with this? Aaron getting this? Wow. <laughs> there he is. Oh god, if Mikasa's even better. Imagine Levi now. Could Levi get even better than he was? He was already pretty perfect. And they still got Armin waiting somewhere, but also Reiner. <laughs> Levi does not care. He does not care. Just as Lee. You don't know what we've been through, man. Yeah, this is Erwin Smith's scouts. As much as that hurts me to say, in light of, like, the total lack of morality. Erwin, <laughs> come back. We need you. Alright, so first of all, I want to say it's an amazing episode. It's a lot of fun. The tension is perfect. It's got that Attack on Titan tragedy that I've grown to love, as, as weird as that is to hear myself say. It gives you a lot of the things you really want. Like, you want Mikasa and Levi to show up and be awesome. You want the scouts to be badass. It's also great that you actually have some stakes in both sides. I care a lot about the kids. You know, I don't want the kids to die. I feel terrible about Udo. It's a great mix of, like, being compelling, but being sad. And actually, it gives me it gives me a little bit more faith in the story and the writing. Because one thing that I'm, I've sort of been waiting to see is, like, well, what's the final analysis? You know, is, is life all just bleak? Is everything just cruel? Is there no right or wrong? Or does right or wrong solely depend on what side you're on or what your perspective is? You know, is it totally relative in that way? But I feel like this episode is a step in the other direction. It seems to me there's a statement being made about cycles. There's direct parallels to like how the show started. Like this is the beginning of a similar journey to Eren for like Gabby, for example. It's very possible, very likely that all the tragedy we've experienced in the show is starting again. So can that really be the right thing? I don't think so. I think that's an answer in some way. Although, you know, there's still ways for that to go still. Who knows? We're on a path. <laughs> we are on a path right now. It's not looking good, but you know, being the optimistic person that I am, even though the scouts are doing these things, even though they're following Eren, and even though they seem to be sort of like accepting terrible things in the name of other things that they want, you know, like survival, which is perfectly understandable. I don't mean to say that their actions are like completely unsympathetic. There is always the opportunity at any moment for them to start to do right. And I think some of the characters are primed for that. Like I think Mikasa is showing some uncertainty. And so whatever wrong she's done in the past, whatever mistake she's making right now, it would feel great if she was able to do something else. And that potential exists. Same thing for Reiner. Reiner is on this Marley path. He has done unspeakable things, yet in this moment there are things he can do that are that are good. Same goes for all of them. The only one that I've sort of given up on is Aaron. And it's not to say that he couldn't, it's just that he, he's not showing any signs of it. He's not showing any signs of reflection. I mean, he hasn't really shown much of that throughout the series. He seems pretty resolute, even though he kind of acknowledged what Mikasa said about killing civilians. He's like, just a price you gotta pay, right? But to me, it's a price too high. I mean, what's the point of victory? You know, if this is just the world, this is a zero-sum game. It's less than a zero-sum game. It just makes things worse. Things spiral. It's a little bit tough for me to say, you know, because I'm here on my high horse talking about like, oh, this is awful, but you know, my life isn't at stake. My people aren't at stake. My country isn't at stake. So I'm not saying that I could do better. And I'm not saying that this isn't understandable. I'm just saying if we're talking about like heroism, you know, if we're talking about ideals, which I think shows largely are an attempt at expressing. This is not it. This is more of like a cautionary tale. This is a warning. This is one of the problems of the ends justify the means type thinking is that anybody can justify just about anything. You can always find threats. You can always find ways others have harmed you. There are always terrible things that we have temptations to do that other people have already done in the past. You know, if we're going into the hyper idealistic, I think there's more to it than just winning. In a way, there's a, there's a big game to be played there's something better to be had which is like true connection to what's right and to to who you are and who you want to be a kind of harmony with oneself and one's existence and making a commitment to not be the evil that you hate that is something that is totally in your control and is something that is priceless and I think there's a parallel with that and the idea of freedom for Aaron. You know, like, Aaron is always thinking about freedom, and freedom first means this, you know, like getting out of the walls, and then beating the Titans, and then, okay, now it means crossing the sea, and now it means just destroying everyone who could ever be a threat. Aaron is just as trapped now as he ever has been. His biggest trapping is himself. Like, he can't get over his own weaknesses, his own lack of perspective. Aaron, at this rate, in this state he's in, in this way of operating, will never be free no matter what he accomplishes, just as there's no victory in creating the same evil. There's some connection to to principles that that's missing and to get even crazier what i'm talking about is not arbitrary it's like coded into the very existence of humanity 
and the universe. <laughs> it's tough, you know, because there are, there are all these conflicting forces. There is the survival of the individual, which is really important, which is why we have selfish tendencies, which is why we have instincts to survive above all else, because the individuals need to want to survive in order for the species to survive. Yet, there's also the survival of the species. And there are some behaviors that if practiced widely by the individuals, will wipe out the species. And so these two conflicting forces create this very, very confusing moral system where we have all these drives for survival at any cost, which may raise our chances of survival, but may totally reduce the chances of survival for the species. And while I don't have it totally nailed down, I think that might partly be where our morality, our learned morality comes from. You know, it's like we've existed as civilizations and as a people for so long, we've learned certain lessons. It's like, well, if you go down this path of survival for yourself as an individual above all else, actually there's a net loss to individuals, not a net gain even though that's counterintuitive. And while I don't know exactly what those rules are, to me, it speaks to the fact that it's more than just whatever I want is the truth or whatever I think is valid or as valid as other things. No, there are other structures. This is not it for society, right? This is not it for people. If we're all Aaron, everyone's dead, it's over. And so part of the question is like, well, who can rise to the ideals? Who can find the ideals, first of all, and then do the difficult work of actually living those ideals despite the intense personal desires to override them, to get what, what we want, even when we feel deep down that what we're doing is somehow wrong. I'm curious to see how this will unfold, but I have a feeling that Aaron is, is gone. And so my question is just, what is everyone else going to do around him? Long rants aside, that's the end of episode five. Before the video ends, I got to give a very long overdue thank you to all my patrons for the support and basically to everybody for watching. It's been a little bit weird. Recently, I'm on the road. So like, this is literally just a wall at the house I'm staying. Not that my setup was ever really that great. <laughs> the schedule has been a little bit off. I've been a little bit late. So I really appreciate the patience. Things will stabilize really soon. In fact, I think I can go back to normal now, basically. Although there will be a lot of these like random backgrounds for a little bit. But yeah, special and long overdue shout out goes to people who joined the top tier on Patreon. Taylor Shea, Sister of Aluria, Robin Funkhauser, Shadow Blitz 56, Kasu Joe, The Knight 777, Marcelo, Raz, and Corey Price. Thank you to you. Thank you to all my patrons for all the support. It means so much to me. Love all of you guys. Thank you to everyone for watching and I'll see you guys very soon for the next episode. <laughs>